Hello. Welcome to Internet TCI, our monthly program where we explore the global Internet. My name is Rich Wiggins, and as always, I'd like to introduce my partner in crime, Charles Severance. Thanks, Rich. I think we're going to have a fun hour. Uh, on our On the Road segment, you are going to interview the first White House webmaster and other things as well. So tell me, what's going on Internet-wise with you since our last show? Well, Chuck, um, as you're always doing, I'm always trying to find out in the popular media and throughout the world what's going on in terms of things Internet. This comes from a friend of mine, and it's a good idea for you webmasters out there. This is from my friend um, who works at a state agency here in Michigan. And what they've done is they put up a web page where they said, you know, we want to tell the world about our web page. Let's send them all a postcard with the URL on it. Now, traditionally, you get up on the web and you think, okay, now I'm on the web, everybody will find me. But what this recognizes is not everyone lives on the web, and the folks that need to get hold of your information um, may be somewhere else. They may be living in the physical world instead of in cyberspace. This is a way to get hold of them, and I think later in the show we'll go and look at this page cool. in our surfing segment. Cool. Second item I want to talk about, you know, there's been this trial going on about the constitutionality of the Communications Decency Act. And we have a headline here that I find rather amusing. Internet search for little women gets naked ladies. During testimony in this trial, what happened was um, someone uh, on the prosecutor's side asked a witness, what would happen if we did a search for the book Little Women by Louisa May Alcott? And dramatically, you know, this proves that the Internet is an evil place. He found that you could, in fact, pull up pictures of, of uh, naked women. Um, but on cross-examination, the witness went further and they said, well, you know, if you tried to take the word sex or anything that had anything to do with any potentially indecent topic completely out of all library-type searches, well, you couldn't, you couldn't do anything about plants because plants procreate, after all. You, um, you couldn't do anything about uh, geology. Um, if we were talking about rock and roll, they, you know, you say rock and, and you'll land on rock and roll pages. And just overall, what a nightmare it would be if we tried to take any keyword that you could feed into a search engine and never use it again on the Internet. Right. So, um, the final item I want to talk about, we're always hunting for URLs. Right. And um, at the bottom of the New York Times, my favorite newspaper, they've always run these little weird advertisements. And I think they cost probably $1,000 a piece. Front page of the New York Times, you wouldn't expect they've had, they would have advertising on that. But at the bottom, you could have a little ad thanking somebody for a gift they gave you or congratulating somebody on a high school graduation or whatever. But now these ads are increasingly being used to advertise web pages. Sort of like a postcard. It's kind of like the postcard idea we were talking about a minute ago. And if you think about it, it shows sort of the macro power of a URL. Right. All you have to do is say, we are, for instance, in this case, C-SPAN. And if you want our URL, um, if you want our website, type in this URL and you're there. Here, so I'll go, I'll go there now. We're going to see more and more advertising, I think, that follows that, that sort of a paradigm. You take a little thumbnail ad and you give very little content. You just point people to the website, and the website's where they get all the cool information. So here's, here's C-SPAN. Here's that URL. So do you have anything on here that... Uh... <clears throat> well, there's a couple of interesting things. One thing on screen here, we're looking um, in that little panel that you see at examples of what's going on now on C-SPAN. So over here. Right. right, and that gets periodically updated through a technology called server push. Um, I'll hit the reload and force it to update. Well, we think we will. Here we go. And this is a baby example of what's referred to as convergence, and what we mean by that is something that was coming out over one medium, cable TV, is beginning to come out over the Internet. And, of course, this gets into double irony when we use a cable modem to go and access this data, which is what we're doing right now here in the studio. Uh, another thing they're doing is if the House or Senate is in session, in real time you can listen to the audio feed of the House or Senate as it would be carried by C-SPAN, but you can get it in real audio over the Internet. Right here, I got it up. I brought that up to simulcast of the House and Senate sessions, but right now it's... As we tape today, unfortunately, right. politicians are out pontificating somewhere. They're not in session. They're so. probably getting free lunches or something. They're, exactly. So, Chuck, what's been going on Internet-wise for you? <laughs> well, my... my uh, favorite page that uh, I've run across. I've got a new job, by the way. I <laughs> moved uh, across campus at Michigan State University into the College of Engineering, and one of the topics that's been bugging me in, in terms of the last couple weeks is how to, re how to boot Windows 95 
uh, from boot ROMs rather than from diskless. So I've been spending a lot of time on the uh, Microsoft page. Uh, let me grab it here. Go to the Microsoft page. And uh, sort of free technical support and seeing how Microsoft free technical support works. And uh, what I'm going to do now is I, I, I'm at Microsoft and I'm going to the search. And I'm just sitting here late at night fooling around. And I say, diskless boot. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I could have had a CD-ROM. There are CD-ROMs that do this kind of stuff. And actually, Microsoft has some better CD-ROMs that uh, have more information. There's a, there's a technical uh, CD-ROM. But this is something that sort of just to gather a little bit of information. I'll page down a little bit. <coughs> there, I can't boot NT on a diskless workstation. But later, we have to go another page here. I've already done this. So um, if we go down another page, we'll see basically set up on how to set Windows 95 up for for a diskless boot. Excellent. There we go. Floppy date, di server based. This is what they call their knowledge base. And basically, it's for Windows 95, and this gives you a step by step how to set it up. Now, I haven't successfully done this, but I'm going to work on this and, and see if I can't get this to work. Um, but so I'm using a lot for work, you know, just to accomplish the things then and, and, uh, and scanning stuff on the net that uh, I might otherwise need to get a, a CD ROM for. Great. So, Hey, you, uh, you found a URL the the uh, <coughs> bottom of the uh, New York Times, but I think I found a URL. I mean, we sort of have this competition of who finds URLs in more cool places. Um, and, like you found one on a bandana and all this stuff. Well, I, I opened up my mail this month, and I found a URL in a really interesting place. I found a URL right at the very bottom of my mobile bill. Okay, and again, just like the, it's a little, little communication. And so the address is... Uh, www.mobile.com. So let's. I'm going to pop and go to uh, www.mobile.com. Now, now, the thing that I needed to do is my the little um, magnetic stuff on the back of my credit card had worn off because I'd used it so many times. And I was thinking, this is great. I'll be able to automatically request a credit card. Now, I didn't quite find that. I was I was hoping to find a. A thing because then I then I called the 800 number and I never even talked to a human. I mean I was I was punching little keys in and they they automatically sent me one. I never had a human do anything, mm. which is very cost effective. And there's no reason they couldn't have done that same thing. You know I type in my account number and I say send me a new card. They already have my address. So I thought that'd be that's kind of neat, you know. And you know what'll be next? What? Visit the web page to pay the bill. Yeah, that's that's a little scarier, but. So here's a, here's a credit card application for a mobile card. Looks just like the one I use. So, so I thought that was pretty cute. So I found one Neat. on a bill. Neat. Anything else internet-wise? No, nothing special. Well, you know, Chuck, we do have something special with regards to you. Um, you mentioned that you've got a new position. Yes. You're the director of computing for the College of Engineering at Michigan State. Unbeknownst to you, Charles, I entered your workspace with a secret camera and I caught a little bit of footage of you, Charles Severance, at work in your new position. And let's see what it's like. <laughs> is Here he is, Chuck, at work. Yes. Looks like... Uh, How long does it take you to get that S painted on your back, anyhow? You know, I, I, I certainly plug Michigan State University every chance <laughs> I get. Where is this? Is this a hockey game? Or no, a football this is game? A, See, there's, there's the beard, there's the hat. It, it's really Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. This is, exactly. That was the first game of the uh, that was played in the new stadium that we have for the Lansing Lugnuts. It was actually an MSU versus U of M baseball game. Oh, okay. And okay. despite your dressing that way, I have to tell you that uh, MSU was clobbered. Um, our baseball team is not doing, not has doing been so well. clobbered all year long. Very, very right? bad. Yes. So. <laughs> Thanks for that. I uh, you're welcome. Didn't know you know, I didn't know you cared. Well, yes, we try to. Uh, try to promote each other as, as best we can. <laughs> so let's move on and uh, see what else is out there on the net. Okay. In our Internet for Everyone segment, Rich is going to tell us about AltaVista, the search engine from the Digital Equipment Corporation. So Rich, tell us about AltaVista. Thanks, Chuck. The internet, as we know, is remarkable for the speed at which new services come along and eclipse previous services. Right. But even in that even in that remarkable environment, I think AltaVista is extraordinary in its own right. It was announced by Digital Equipment Corporation in December of 1995. Within six weeks, a million queries a day were being handled by AltaVista. Within five months, 10 million queries a day were being handled by AltaVista. AltaVista is a full-text index of the entire World Wide Web, or everything it can find on the World Wide Web, 
and all of Usenet, the global discussion medium that's part of the Internet. Um, DEC has decided that AltaVista is going to be useful not only as a search engine that people can visit centrally, they're also going to market AltaVista for various interesting applications, and maybe we can talk about that in just a few minutes. The way AltaVista works as a central search service is they have a little piece of software that they call a scooter. And the scooter software goes and visits every web find that it, every website that it can find anywhere on the internet. And as we tape this today, there's about 200,000 web servers that it's indexing. On those servers, if you added together all the documents you could find, we come up with over 30 million total URLs. Now, the scooter software, which for other services might be referred to as a harvest piece of software, goes out and builds an index of each word on every page that it can find out there on the Internet. As of today, that index holds over 15 billion words. One of the features of AltaVista that we'll see as we see some examples in a few minutes is it's not only a word index, it's also a phrase index, and it does a very good job of keeping up with words in context of the phrases. So the Alta Vista service has a server sitting out there in Palo Alto um, that happens to be powered by a DEC Alpha engine. Once they've built that index, they've got actually it's several servers sitting and waiting for queries as people come in um, with new things they want to look for. So let's say we want to do a search on Alta Vista. We want to look for information about, let's say, digital cameras. How do we do this? Well, when you connect to the uh, AltaVista service at www. Oops, help me here, Chuck. What's wrong with that? www.altavista.digital.com. <laughs> it's a common trap that you get into. You might expect that IBM's homepage is www.ibm.com. Right. It turns out AltaVista isn't at www.altavista.com. Right. It's at altavista.digital.com. Right. And one thing that I found is recently I went off to the wrong page. And the folks at www.altavista.com are real thrilled with this because they said, we're not AltaVista, but let us tell you about who we are. We're the AltaVista company, and we do internet consulting. So they were getting thousands and thousands of hits per day. Um, today, as I was preparing our materials for this talk, I went there. Their server's down. For all I know, 10 million hits a day with 10% going astray to the wrong server has killed these people. In any event, we want to go to altavista.digital.com. And if we do, we'll see a screen that looks like this. We can type in digital camera, for instance, right here in a very simple one-box form. There's nothing elaborate we have to fill in. And after you're done, unlike some web forms, you don't have to click on the Submit button. You can just hit Enter, and it will go ahead, go ahead and go off and do the search for you. When the results come back, and sometimes they're astonishingly fast, sometimes it's just a second or two, sometimes it might take half a minute, you will get back a little report here. It'll say, these, these are the words that I counted for you. Camera appeared so many times in my index. Digital appeared so many times in my index. And when I combined those, I found 70,000 documents out of 30 million on the World Wide Web that seem to have the phrase you're looking for. Let me give you a report of the first 10 of these. And it will give you a hyperlinked list with a little bit of an abstract. It pulls out some of the words at the beginning of the document. It'll also give you in text form the URL of what you've found. And for instance, here we're at www.zdnet.com. After you've surfed for a while, you say, well, ZDNet, that's Ziff Davis. That's PC Magazine. And you have an idea before you even click on this particular page, do I want to go there? Is that going to be a likely place to bear fruit for me? Now, going on through the list, you'll find other candidate sites that you might pick among. And some of these will be at corporate sites, some of these will be at universities, some of these will be individual personal home pages. One of the challenges that a service like AltaVista faces is that it weighs all of these things more or less equally. And it'll be up to you to go through the candidate list of documents and pick the ones that seem to be, in fact, from reliable sources and, in fact, directly relevant to what you want to do. But let's say we follow one of these hyperlinks. Let's say we do go off to Ziff Davis. They own a magazine called Computer Shopper, and they have an article here about digital cameras, and this was in the October 1995 issue. And you might say, well, this is in fact worth reading, and you'll go ahead and scroll down and read through the article. Now, if you have more than 10 sites that seem to fill the bill, AltaVista will give you a clever little index of uh, sort of hyperlinks at the bottom of the page. So scroll down to the bottom of that first page, and you'll see something that looks like this. Page number 1 through 20, let's say. Well, we start off, obviously, with the first 10 items on page 1. 
If we want to jump down to the 201st item through 210th in the list, then we click over here on this little hyperlink and that'll take us there. If instead we want to go to the uh, 11th through 20th, we click on page 2, and there we are on documents 11 through 20, once again out of the 70,000 that originally matched our search query. Now AltaVista is going to do the best it can to present these in some sort of a reasonable order. And not surprisingly, the farther down you go in the list, the closer you get to document 70,000, the less likely it is to in fact be useful to you and match what you're looking for. It's useful to keep in mind that AltaVista is not just an index of the World Wide Web. It's also an index of Usenet. Now on Usenet, you may have a bunch of people carrying on informal discussions about digital cameras. On the World Wide Web, you may have more formal kinds of communication, for instance, the articles that we found in Computer Shopper. But if we go and do this very same search in Usenet, all we have to do is click on this little pick list option, and we type Usenet, and we uh, select Usenet, type in our search query, and we get back a list of articles in various news groups. As it happens, bit.listserve.edtech is a news group that resides at Michigan State, but it's mirrored in Usenet. And there's an article on digital cameras. And here we have somebody who's asking a particular question about the topic of digital cameras. If we followed that thread, we would eventually find discussion about what I've bought recently, what's useful, what's not useful, and so forth. Let's say we're going to do a different AltaVista search now. We're searching back on the web. Let's search for the word Saturn. We click there. We get a result set back that might include something about a portable terminal named Saturn, some information on the planet Saturn, some other information about the Sega Saturn. This presents one of the problems in searching the web. One word may exist in many different realms in different contexts. So you may have to adopt some strategies to find the particular use of a word that's appropriate to you. In this case, let's say we're interested in Saturn automobiles. So we'll go and we'll say Saturn dealers is what we're looking for. We re-execute our search, and now, boy, we've really honed in. We've got um, car town Saturn dealers, Texas Saturn dealers, and so forth. So you may have to iterate a few times. You may have to try different phrases back and forth until you get a specific enough phrase that will actually hone in out of 30 million documents on the documents that you're looking for. Common words can always cause various kinds of false hits. Let's say we're a fan of the um, impressionist Rich Little. So we type in Rich Little. Well, if you think about that for a second, the word rich and the word little are common English words, and we may find some false hits here. So we got a reference to a movie, P Poor Little Rich Girl, um, some guy at the University of Michigan, we've landed on his personal page here, um, another reference to a different movie, Poor Little Rich Girl, and so forth. Well, AltaVista lets us refine our search in a different way here. If we capitalize the word rich and the word little, that says we're looking for proper nouns. AltaVista pays attention, and that will narrow our search right there. Also, we can put quotes around the search. When we say, quote, rich, little, quote, that means we're looking for these two words together and contiguous as a phrase. Now let's see what the results look like. Here we've um, gone directly to Rich Little Entertains the Osmond Family Theater, Rich Little Returns to Branson, Missouri, and some sort of a movie about impersonation that Rich Little has done. Sure enough, that strategy of putting the name in as a phrase is very successful for us. It turns out the Alta Vista people have discovered searching for names, surprisingly enough, is the most common form of AltaVista search. And in a lot of cases, it's people looking for themselves. Maybe later on in the surfing segment, we can go and look for Charles Severance and see if he appears anywhere on the global internet. You're not sure whether you do or not? <coughs> I'm there. You've done this particular search. Not on, not, not on AltaVista. I did it on Lycos. But the most common search on AltaVista is looking for names, and probably, a la Steve Martin, you're checking to see if you're in the phone book. I'm in the phone book. Here's a final example of the kind of searching that I've wanted to do lately. I'm going to be speaking in Japan next month, and I wanted to find out about the conference where I was going to be speaking. So I said, well, it's the Windows World 96 conference. Let's try Windows World and see if that phrase will find me. Well, I found two million matching documents. These words are simply too common. Let's refine the search a little bit. In AltaVista, if you put a plus sign before what you're searching for, that says, you must find this phrase in the document or don't report it back at all. And I say Windows World with caps as a phrase with 96, 
plus Tokyo, I don't want to see the document unless it has the word Tokyo in it, and IDG, the International Data Group, is sponsoring this conference. And now we hone in very quickly, and we find ourselves on a web page in Japan that describes the particular conference that we're looking for. So once again, the key to using a service like this that's trying to span the entire web is to refine your search as much as possible. All in all, though, it's astonishing how effective a tool like AltaVista is in finding what you're looking for very, very quickly. Neat, Rich. I, the neat thing about having all these uh, search engines is as one begins to slow down, <laughs> another one pops up, and uh, AltaVista certainly is one of the fastest. Do you have any sense of how much hardware they have throwing at this problem? I don't know specifically. I know they've got several servers there. One thing that's really interesting is they're using the Alpha, alpha Alca architecture to its fullest. They have one server that has eight gigabytes of real memory holding about uh, I think it's a quarter of the index in real memory, and that's one of the reasons why this thing is so fast. You've got 64-bit addressing in the alpha, and uh, with that much linear memory, you can do some really, really cool things. And I think that, you know, things like these plus signs and the quotes and the phrases, I think they're going to become more and more important as the size of the web just gets larger and larger and larger. Absolutely. In our interview in a previous episode with um, the inventor Lycos. of Lycos, right we learned that the web is growing at least by a factor of seven per year. That means within about 18 months we're going to have a billion URLs. Right. These engines are going to get pretty fancy in order to help us surf among a billion URLs. Right. Neat. On a recent trip to Washington, D.C., I visited with the first White House webmaster, David Lytell. So for today's On the Road segment, we'll learn what it was like building the first White House web presence. Hi, Chuck. We're here at the White House, and we're going to have a conversation with the first White House webmaster, David Lytell. I was the co-developer and the managing editor for Welcome to the White House, the White House service on the Internet. From the uh, time we began in uh, March of 94, uh, through the present day. My involvement in the creation of the White House website was really out of a motivation to pursue through this other means the administration's policy goals for the commercialization and privatization of the internet and the uh, development of the national information infrastructure. When did you decide to, to make a White House website? Well, it's important to point out that the website for us was not our first service on the Internet. In fact, it was our third service on the net. We started with a White House publication service that was operational as of the first day the president was elected because it was a legacy from the 1992 campaign. It was something that was built for um, both of the candidates uh, by um, the uh, AI lab at MIT. In 93, uh, um, almost all of the articles about the Internet in 93 contained an almost obligatory reference that said why you can even send electronic mail to the president and vice president and here's how. Uh, the president's email is summarized and he gets a summary on a weekly basis just as his paper mail is summarized and he gets a, a summary on a weekly basis. And we thought back in those days we expected to see a difference, a substantive difference, in what it is people said through email um, versus what they said through postal mail. As a, as a practical matter, what's turned out uh, in our experience is that that is not the case. In fact, um, the only difference is that the president's email contains um, the same substantive messages he will receive two days later in his postal mail. When we started the design of version 2.0 of Welcome to the White House, we looked at where the net was going to be approximately six months in the future. It's not good enough to design for where the net is now. If you're designing a new service and you know the development process is going to take some number of months, you try to design for where the net is going to be. and. We believed that um, 
real audio was, uh, since it was going to be um, uh, built in with um, uh, the uh, Microsoft browser, that it was a uh, plug-in that was going to come with the shipped, shrink-wrapped version of um, uh, Netscape, that probably more than a million people, uh, which is kind of a seat of the pants threshold number, would have access to audio in real audio format by Christmas time. So we thought we did want to support audio. We wanted to continue to use uh, the White House site to promote the development and the advance of um, uh, the web and the internet. And and then we asked ourselves, well, what did we have that was especially suitable, and how would be, what would be the best way to go about serving audio? So what we did is we took the president's Saturday radio addresses, because they're short, and because we could do 100% of them, and because we knew on a going forward basis we would be able to continue to do the Saturday radio addresses. But we didn't just want to offer them in runtime from the beginning to the end. We wanted to make it possible for people to search for segments, audio segments, within a Saturday radio address. So people can come in and do a search on either all of the content of the website, or if they want to, they can search only the audio that we have on the website. And they can type in a plain language query and get back the segments of the President's Saturday radio addresses that best address that sentence uh, query. They can, if they wish, they can go and begin any of that Saturday radio address from the beginning, or they can jump to that segment of the address, of the address that directly talks about the subject that is interesting uh, to that person. Uh, in some ways, it's unfortunate that the language um, that's been adopted to describe uh, web sites is a home page. I always bristle at that. It's not a page any more than I'm wearing a thread. I'm wearing a lot of threads. Uh, and um, I always make reference to it as a, as a website uh, rather than as a home page. But I think people, people's expectations are when they come to the White House site that it's a literal home page, meaning a couple of screens. Uh, it's about uh, 10,000 screens, actually, if you were to get into it. Happily, we've been able to secure what should be the ideal address for Democrats Online, www.democrats.com. Uh, the official Democratic Party site is at democrats.org. We managed to build the White House site as an important government site, but now it's time to do politics. A political campaign, government in general, but a political campaign most particularly, is a almost purely information processing enterprise. That's all it does. It doesn't make anything. It takes in information. It um, uh, processes that information, and it makes decisions based on that information. So the, the uh, advantage goes to those organizations that manage the, their communications with the outside world in the most efficient way. The first couple of months of an election year, it becomes more interesting to do politics than it does to do government. And it, um, my background is equally uh, political as it is governmental. I was interested in and fascinated by the opportunities presented to political communication by the growth of the internet. And I very much wanted to um, be involved in pioneering the new applications of the internet for political communication. Um, polls, uh, exit polls uh, from the participants in the New Hampshire primary, where 13% um, of the people uh, who voted said that the um, uh, Manchester Union leader was their most important source of information uh, on uh, deciding how to cast their ballot. But 2% said the internet was the most important source of information. Now, 2% doesn't sound like a lot until you realize that the overwhelming majority of the population has access to the Manchester Union leader, and that New Hampshire actually is not an especially uh, wired state. Uh, the, the percentage of the population with access to the net in New Hampshire probably doesn't surpass 10%. So for 2% of the population at large to say the internet was the most important reason, the most important source of information, I think augurs quite well uh, for the internet as a political medium.
I think what the net is most useful for is user-generated content. The subject of the internet is not what it is the person that built the site is trying to say. The subject on the net is you. The subject is the person on the other side of the keyboard. I think Democrats Online can have a significant impact. Um, I, many of the applications for um, politics will be pioneered uh, for the first time in this election cycle. Some of them are going to work and some of them aren't going to work. And we're going to try all that we can think of. And uh, I think we have some confidence that uh, we know enough about the net and about what's useful to politics to be able to really forge um, the uh, applications that will make a difference. Yeah. That's pretty neat, Rich. The thing that I would be most curious, I mean, I, would, I, I, I wonder if you asked him this question, what it was like being in Washington, D.C. when this whole thing just sort of just taken off like wildfire? Because I, you know, I've known other people in other governmental agencies and they just a land rush, like Oklahoma land rush to the web. I mean, did, he, did, he, did you talk to him about that? What it was like to kind of go from when there was no web to kind of web everywhere? Well, a little bit. One of the points that he made to me was that he was hired to be a policy analyst to talk about national information infrastructure, and he talked about that briefly during our segment. Um, what happened was, if you think about the timing of the Clinton administration coming into office, right. the web explosion occurred that year, right. in, in the year of 1993. They were aggressive about jumping on that and picking a technology they thought was going to win, and it turned out to be the web. They were right. So. Paradoxically, I mean, these days, do you hear people talk very much about the national information infrastructure? No, not not at all. Although I'm involved in some of the standards efforts, uh, and so I'm, I keep track of that. So they're still actually doing work, but it's not uh, grabbing a lot of headlines. That's for sure. So, it, what was most visible in terms of what the world saw was not any a document about what we ought to do in the NII. What was most visible and had the most impact was the White House presence on the web. And uh, as he pointed out, that wasn't the first thing on the internet that was done by the right. White House, but it's certainly the most visible. Um, the other item being sending email to the president, as he pointed out. Now the question is, what is going to happen this year in terms of using the net and the web for politics, for electing people? And it's going to be real interesting to watch and see if what he said in terms of um, the two percent of the people in New Hampshire were swayed by internet-based information. Is that really going to mushroom during this calendar year, during this election cycle? I think the internet has the real advantage in, in politics is that you can, you can, uh, you control what you want to see as compared to seeing a commercial where they kind of blast it at you. And so I think that's one of the advantages that the internet has. The consumer picks what they want to learn. Exactly. In today's Tech Talk segment, Chuck's going to tell us how we can plug in the multimedia applications on the internet. Chuck? Thanks, Rich. Basically, the uh, Netscape always, once you've got Netscape running, that's the beginning. I mean, you really sort of have to, you know, accessorize your Netscape and, you know, so you've got flames coming out the side. And that's what tonight's Tech Talk is all about, is accessorizing Netscape with plugins and helper applications. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight on Tech Talk. So the title of Tech Talk tonight is Netscape Helper Applications, Plugins, and Built-ins. So in the very beginning, the program called Mosaic, it used what are called helper applications. And there's actually discussion in the very beginning about this was a philosophy. Let's not clutter Mosaic up. Let's keep Mosaic very pure. So this was a philosophical thing. So that if you wanted to view some kind of an audio or hear some audio or view some kind of a video, you had to have a helper, separate helper application. Mosaic was very simple. It displayed HTML, text, and graphics interchange format or GIF files directly. But things like uh, JPEG, you had to have a viewer, uh, MPEG, which is an uh, uh, animation format, uh, PostScript, you needed a helper application. The common one was a uh, ROPS, and Q QTW was the a, a QuickTime viewer. Now, the way a helper application works is that a program such as Mosaic <coughs> would actually download the information from the internet and copy it to a temporary file on the disk and then fire up a separate program to actually view this information from the temporary file. And then when the user was done viewing it, the helper application would be closed and they would go back to Mosaic. 
<clears throat> the problem is, with this is that it was a bit jarring, okay? The beginning user would all of a sudden see new windows popping up and they would have to get rid of them and they'd have to understand that I'm running two programs. Um, <clears throat> so with Mosaic, you ended up having to get all these basic helper applications. That was another annoying thing. Simple things like audio. Okay, you, you, you have Mosaic and you had to go get audio. It's sort of like the first three things you had to do. Well, Netscape, becoming a commercial company, wanted to be a little more clever, so they started including these. So what you tended to get right away was they, they had an audio player that came with every Netscape, so we had, didn't have to go run out and get an audio viewer. The other thing, probably even more important than audio, was they made it so JPEG could be viewed right in the, uh, in the browser. If you go back, JPEG weren't even viewable by the browser. And JPEG was? Joint expert, joint picture. photo experts group. But Thank the importance you. of it was it was a different image format than the GIF, than, than the common GIF format. And if we didn't have a viewer for it, we couldn't look at those kinds of images at all. Right, and that also happened right around the time that there was the copyright fl uh, flack about the uh, about the GIF format. Right. So uh, that's pretty much over. But both formats are still heavily used. Mm -hmm. But uh, the fact that Netscape viewed JPEGs in line uh, gave choices among GIF, GIF or JPEG. So. Now, Netscape uh, also has this feature called plugins. And plugins actually, unlike a helper application, sort of extend and expand what's inside of Netscape. Adobe Acrobat was an early plugin that I thought was pretty neat. What happens is a plugin, unlike a helper application, extends and seems as though it's part of Netscape. And it sort of takes over sort of the viewable area of Netscape. And what might happen is a plugin may actually do other stuff, may further interact with the internet, do, do various things. But the neatest thing is, is users may never know that re they're really using a plugin. For example, to get out of the plugin, you press the familiar back key to get out, and you back right out of the plugin, and the plugin stops running. So <clears throat> there's one URL that's a really good place to go for, for, for plugins, and this is the URL that Netscape sends you to after you've finished installing Netscape. And it's uh, home.netscape.com slash home setup.html. And a couple of the plugins are uh, Real Audio, which is a streaming audio plugin, Live3D, which is their VRML browser, a uh, uh, plugin called CoolTalk, which is real time communication, has chat, phone, whiteboarding, um, Shockwave, which we'll play with later, uh, from Macro Media, which is sort of a, uh, like a children's CD ROM book, and various other things with animation. And another thing that, I'm, uh, that I, ju I just went and looked at all these again. And there's a whole bunch of these things called that do streaming animation. Real audio was sort of early, and we've done on previous shows real audio. And we, we kept thinking, when's the stream, streaming animation going to come? Well, folks, it's here. Sizzler is one of them. More plugins. <coughs> there's a streaming MPEG viewer called uh, Action from Open to You. There's a streaming AVI viewer called Cool Fusion. Another streaming MPEG. And what these streaming viewers do is they pull the data down, and as the first bits of the data come into your screen, you begin to see it in Netscape. And then the rest of it comes, and you see it as it's, as it's coming down, and then you can replay it once it's uh, all come down. Unlike the helper applications, where you sat for a very long time waiting for the information to be downloaded, and then you got it all downloaded, then you could see it. So the streaming ones do it right now. They do it as, as fast as your uh, modem or your internet connection can handle it. Uh, Movie Star was uh, for streaming QuickTime. Uh, video Live is a, uh, streaming video. I think what we're seeing here is we're seeing a kind of a, a stress between different technologies where one of these is going to become uh, more popular than the others based on what the providers use. Real Audio, for example, the Real Audio people put a lot of material out in Real Audio and encourage the formation of material, which helps their viewer work a lot better. Uh, AutoCAD drawings, you can view AutoCAD drawings. My thought when I saw that was, that's something far more for an intranet than an internet. So you have a Ford or motor company viewing AutoCAD drawings over their own intranet using Netscape, which, you know, that's intranets is something we haven't really talked about a great deal on the, on the show. Now, some trends in this is plugins still require some effort. I mean, I've spent some time on this computer we're using for the show, about an hour before the show, kind of getting everything working. We're not using Netscape 3.0 on the show right now. Um, what Netscape 3.0 does is it optionally bundles these plugins. So not only do you get the audio player and the built-in viewers, but you're getting a bunch of plugins as well. And now it's sort of, it, you hardly notice that you're doing any work at all. The ones that Netscape 3.0 is bundling is uh, live audio, which is going to do uh, AU format 
uh, Apple, uh, Apple format, WAV files, MIDI files, the AVI uh, live video, which may, be, may become the winner. I don't know. That's the one that uh, Microsoft Windows supports. Uh, they got VRML through Live 3D and Java, JavaScript, and their CoolTalk, which is their phone, chat, and uh, whiteboard program. So here's just a few suggestions, because I've been fooling with this last couple of days. First suggestion, start with a clean slate once in a while. At some point, you've been, you've been customizing your poor Netscape so long that it's in really bad shape. The best thing to do is throw it all away, get a new copy of Netscape, download the right plugins, and start over from scratch. Um, reinstall from scratch. Now, what I always do is keep a good spare copy of Netscape 2.0 beta, not a beta, 2.0, Uns, re, all zipped up, ready to install, so that when you wipe everything out of your hard disk, you can put Netscape 2.0 and then download the things. Make sure you don't keep a beta because the beta is always expire. You keep a production copy and then you can set your system back up. But I highly recommend uh, throwing things out every once in a while. So that's sort of my. Uh, let, let me. I want to show you a couple of these okay. things. I want to surf a little bit. So what do you think of that? Well, while you're pulling up tools, let me make a couple of points. I think basically you're saying that the internet is becoming more animated. Right. And the plugins are the tools that are providing these different kinds of animation. We still have a problem of incompatible formats. Things haven't shaken out. We don't have one particular kind of animation format we're going to use. But what's nice is, number one, going and getting a plugin can allow us to easily grab hold of this new individual format as it comes out. Right. The most popular formats are going to be bundled in Netscape 3.0, and you won't have to do what you did for an hour this right. afternoon. You won't have to go out and grab each one right. individually. So what are you going to show us here? Well, the first one I want to show you is I want to show you Shockwave. I, I think Shockwave is one of the neatest um, because Shockwave is a tool that's going to allow us to cruise between uh, sort of the CD-ROM view of the world and um, and the internet view of the world because the internet is so non-interactive you click and you go somewhere and you click and you go somewhere uh, the page I'm at is a page called cyber kids and and the one I'm going to show you is a, a book that was uh, written by someone who put this up uh, Willia Bacoy she wrote a story and then someone turned it in using a a, a piece of software called macro mind director <coughs> and uh, made, a, made sort of a living book out of it. Uh, Broderbund has a, a series of uh, com computerized books on CD-ROM. And what this is, is this is sort of an interactive living book <coughs> that's coming over the internet. Each piece is going to be downloaded as we click on it. And so you see there's some animation. Sometimes there's even audio associated with it. And there's things we can do. We'll, we'll move over by the cat. The cat jumps up when we move over. So this is sort of like a kid's game. We see the little clock and it's tick-tock, tick-tock. Okay, now following the points that you made, we are sitting within our Netscape browser, within a, right. within a client area there, and all of this animation is going on, and as you move the cursor, and back to the cat that you showed, we didn't do anything special. We didn't hit the, the button or anything. We right. just put the cursor on the area and activity occurs. And this is software that this uh, Macromedia company has been doing for years and years and years, and now they're just extending it over the internet. It, it was really an authoring tool for the right. CD-ROM world. Exactly. And now we've turned it into an authoring tool. So we're gonna we're gonna open the door here. Uh, this little girl has written about her uh, her house. So we, and and just like a, it, and again the the uh, just like in those books, we're gonna go to the next page now, and so we can see these lights and and you can see that we're downloading something and so we're sort of going to the next CD-ROM frame as it were sort of if you were at home with a CD-ROM you'd see the CD-ROM light blinking and and here we come and so now we have the lights are on and the lights are off and and again this is a, a nice little story you know when the lights are on we'll click the lights on and off I think we're here yeah the fly should start flying around here catch the fly okay <laughs> it's not starting well, we'll go to the next page. I guess this proves another point about all of this, which is in some ways this stuff isn't completely ready for prime time. We're going and plugging into these universes, and the software doesn't always do what we want when we want. Yeah, another observation while we're waiting for this to download, I was doing this at home, and there's very few things on the Internet that I don't feel comfortable doing from home, but I really got tired at home at 28.8 doing any of this. I mean, we've got a pretty good connection here in the studio, and it's a lot more fun to uh, interact with this stuff. So uh, since I have a cable modem at my house, I might enjoy this. Yes. It's, I mean, it, you, it would take, you know, a minute and a half to go from one screen to another screen. So it, it's quite, uh, quite painful. So this just gives you sort of an example. And I, basically the idea is to extend the style of the CD-ROM interaction across the Internet. And plugins are going to make that possible. Yep.
Let's see what's going on in the news of the net. First off, regional telephone companies are saying they need more money in order to wire the schools of the country. The Telecommunications Act of 1996 required the wiring of schools and libraries. It also required service in terms of phone service to rural areas to be priced at the same rates as urban areas. The U.S. Telephone Association says this isn't fair. It constitutes an unfair subsidy. And they've asked for a rate hike on the order of $10 per month per customer in order to pay for the $11 billion costs of wiring the schools and libraries. The Yahoo company has gone public. We've had yet another internet um, institution that's had an um, initial public offering yielding massive interest. The initial price was $13 per share and instantly we had it jump to $43 per share. Now subsequent to that we've had a decline in the price of Yahoo and in fact we've seen this for other internet companies that went public. Some sober analysts are saying that the valuations of companies like Yahoo are just plain nuts. The Yankee Group is predicting that we're going to see the death of a number of small internet service companies. Competition from the telephone companies and from cable companies is probably going to lead to some sort of a shakeout. The Yankee Group says that there are about 1,400 internet service providers, or ISPs, in the U.S. today, and by the year 2000, we'll have no more than 200. Microsoft has announced they're going to build Java into the Windows 95 operating system. So support for the Java language will be part of the operating system itself. That means that tools like Microsoft's Internet Explorer will have native capability of, of exploiting the Java language built right in. This is a response to the Netscape Corporation and other companies providing their own forms of Java support. The Zenith company has announced that they're going to build an Internet television. This television will have Ethernet capability and software for navigating the web built right into the TV set. That means the box will be suitable for connecting straight to a cable modem. And having announced this sort of a feature, Zenith turned from a television company into an Internet company, and its stock soared. Motorola has begun shipping cable modems in quantity. Now, a lot of people are skeptical about cable modems. They don't think they're really ever going to exist because they were discussed in the industry for so long. Well, the first of million, at least one million cable modems has been shipped, and there are orders from TCI, Time Warner, Comcast, and others. Critics are saying there are still problems with cable modems, but the folks at Motorola say bull feathers. This stuff is working, and it's really in homes today. And of course, Chuck, I can testify that this stuff is really working and it's in homes today. I've got a cable modem in my home. We're using a cable modem right here um, to surf the net. This stuff really does work. Right. Well, I, I, uh, I also am on an email where uh, some cable people talk about the communication trends. And one of the things they, they said, though, was that ISDN is going through the roof right now. And that this year is a great year for ISDN. So I think what the key is, is as customers, we're going to see an amazing array of things in the next couple of years, ISDN, cable modems, and all those things. Well, it's funny. I was just off at a press briefing by Ameritech, and they were talking about where they're going in terms of Internet services. And in one little panel session where they talked about um, where they're going for commerce on the net, all they talked about was publishing. And I raised my hand and said, hi, I'm Rich Wiggins. I write for Internet World Magazine, and I'm a co-host of a No, I didn't list all of this stuff. But I said, um, what about access? What are you going to do in terms of access to the Internet? When will it be as easy for me to connect to the Internet in this room as it is to plug into an AC outlet? And they said in 1998, when something called ADSL is widely deployed, That'll be our way that we can have ubiquitous access. I said, what about ISDN? And they said, well, if you want ISDN, you can have it today. So I don't know. We still have a lot of different technologies to choose among, and I don't, I don't know if it's that easy to plug into ISDN. Who knows? We'll see. We'll see. Today, as we surf, we're going to explore a scene from a movie. Years ago, there was a movie that Steve Martin starred in called The Jerk. And in that movie, at one point, Steve Martin discovered the new phone book was out. I love this scene. He opened it up and he said... I um, absolutely love that scene. Chuck, you could probably quote what he said. He uh, grabbed the phone book, he pulled it out, and his old body started just shivering. He said, I'm in the phone book. I'm somebody. Things are going to start happening to me now. Things are going to start happening to me now. And at that moment, a sniper was across the street with a gun <laughs> and shot at. No, no, he, 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 he picked him out of a phone book and then came and tried to kill him. 
That's amazing. Well, let's hope that there's uh, more uh, beneficial kinds of things that happen if you have a presence on the internet. But we said earlier that the Alta Vista people have discovered the most common search seems to be for people. And they think that it's either you're looking for a long lost buddy or you're looking for yourself. You want to find out, and this is the right. sense of the Steve Martin, right. am I on the internet? Well, you right. know you are. You put the web page up. But let's right. do a search for Charles Severance. OK, well, we'll take internet. a look at for me, see if I'm in the phone book. So we'll take a look. Charles Severance. <clears throat> I love that. I love that movie. Copyright material. Oh, this is, oh, that's for the, I'm, I'm writing a book on the web, and I have a copyright on it. How many have got? Hey, 300. Chuck, do me a favor. What? Options. Options. Okay. Preferences. Four. Preferences. What do you need? Fonts. Fonts. Choose font. 14. Arial. Head for Arial. There you go. No. Okay. Click OK. Click OK. Okay. Now our customers can read what we're doing here. Okay. Well, there's a bunch of stuff. Got about 300. There's all my stuff. Connecting to Unix, Unix, okay. Unix. My phone number, classes I teach, talks. Good stuff. Yeah. Let's, let's look for you. Well, now, I'm going to have less, less information than you are because you have a tendency to put, you probably need to put my, my full name here, Richard. W? No, Richard. Oh. You tend to put up every paper you write, every right. talk that you give, and I don't go quite so far. There you go. Nope, that's somebody with my name in the United Kingdom. Yeah, that's your advantage that you have. Is there's so many people named Richard Wiggins. That's the advantage you have. <coughs> Judy Matthews, there you go. There you go. Okay, so there's there's a couple of Alta Vista searches, classic Alta Vista searches. Okay. You were talking about finding old friends on the net. Yeah. www.switchboard.com, I think, is the neat thing. Oh. They're wonderful. For that, I, I think people who'd like to do uh, class reunions, here, let's go to that for just a sec. We'll come right back to Alta Vista. Well, as you're going and looking, um, we, uh, we recently were visiting with the White House webmaster, Mr. Lytell. Well, he, it turns out he's getting married, and he used Switchboard to look up all of his old friends. Oh, okay. So he sent invitations Okay, so yeah, so here's Switchboard, www.switchboard.com, and I think that's I think it's it's a really neat site. It is. Um, okay, let's go back and do another Alta Vista search. Okay, uh, well, while we were doing the uh, news segment, you said, what the heck's this ADSL stuff? Let's, let's learn a little bit more about that. Right, ADSL. Now, you said that capitalization matters here, so I'm yes, capitalizing. Yes, it does. Although in this case, we're probably unlikely to find lowercase ADSL meaning anything else. Right. But ADSL. There we go. Asynchronous digital subscriber line. And oh, there's one in Japan. Here we had that little argument. ASDL, ISDN in the future. Now, is this uh, news? No, it's. What is this? This is a. Somebody's memo where they're talking about. Uh, that had a lot of text. Yeah. <laughs> but we have a great subject line. Video on demand. Oh, ASDL is gathering tel telephone company adherents. Yeah. ASDL. ADSL. Oh, sorry. High bandwidth this, transport. This is from just a few weeks ago. Yeah. So that's one thing to search for. Um, one thing that uh, you were telling me about earlier is how to search for uh, how many links a particular web page has. Ah, this can be useful once again if you're a web information provider and you want to find out how important you are. There's a bit of a paradox here. In the early days of the web, the first thing people did was they found other sites they thought were cool and they built links to right. them. The more effective Alta Vista becomes, cool. the less necessary it is for anybody to put a link to anywhere. So in the long run, we may end up with an internet that has very few, this is my favorite site over here kinds of links. But the White House, not surprisingly, is a perfect natural. If you're a K through 12 teacher and you want to put up the kinds of sites you think that your kids should visit, right. well, the White House is a well, natural. And another thing is, is that these search engines use the number of sites that point to you as a metric of the value of your page. Right, but in the long run, that'll change. Right, right. Because nobody needs to put links into other sites because you'll use the search engine on demand to find the site. That now, tell us a little bit about the format of this search. That uh, what, What's the format look like? Well, what we're doing here is we say link colon, and then we have a URL. And that says we want the engine to find all the pages that have links to this page. So we're not looking for keywords here. We're looking for links. Right, so this is pages that contain that a pointer to this page. So not surprisingly, we say there's uh, apparently 50,000 or more pages out there that seem to have links to the White House page. And if we were to click on any of these, and they're scattered around the planet, not surprisingly, those are links off to the other page. You want to pick so, one randomly and see if it really has a link? Um, capital PC Users Group. Which capital? 
Washington. Uh, a friend of mine, Gabe Goldberg, runs this page as it happens. <laughs> Small world. Small world. Even smaller. Rockville, Maryland. So somewhere in here we will in fact find the link. You could probably do an internal search with the find, find. button and just type White House. And if you put a space in there like, like it actually has, then we might actually find it. There we go, the White House homepage. Listen to Socks Me Out. Is it really is, works. Is Gabe a uh, Democrat or Republican? I don't know. Oh, okay. Because you, Gabe is your co-host. He's a computer nerd. Right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know his politics. Oh, okay. Let's see. Oh, another thing. Uh, Jerry, uh, one of the people running cameras, he wants us to search for cyber cafes in Beijing. Right? Okay. So how would you phrase that? How would you phrase that? I would do exactly what you just said. Cyber cafe. Cyber. Should I put that in quotes, though? Uh, I don't, not necessarily. Okay. Let's just... Cyber Cafe, how about if I just say Beijing? How do you spell Beijing? B-E-I. B-E-I. J-I-N-G, I believe. G. Is that right? Okay. Well, there's somebody's homepage. Stanford. Chinese Cyber City. Taiwan. I think let's go back. Let's refine our search. Okay, okay. Let's, let's eat the... Uh, space here between cyber and cafe and okay. lowercase the c and cafe because i think cyber cafe tends to be one word like that let's see what we get nothing three thousand now if you go to the cityscape site okay. i believe they in fact have a list of cyber cafes and you may have to um, crawl around a little bit this brings up another useful point. Sometimes when you're um, surfing using an engine like Alta Vista, you'll use it to find the actual site you're looking for, but other times you'll use it to find sites that have lists of sites in a particular topic area. And um, here's the Cambridge Cyber Cafe. Let's back up just a little bit. All right. Here's another little trick. Yeah. We're going to back up in the URL of the site that we landed on. And let's go back to maybe that CB1 and see if that works. We're trying to yeah, I do that. All, I do that all the time. You just kind of cut a piece of it. Cambridge Evening News shop. It's the Cambridge Cyber Cafe. And I think if you hunt through here enough, you'll find a list of other cyber cafes. City, country, cafes, internet. Oh boy, pictures and more. <laughs> Pretty exciting, huh? Yeah. Let's go to the okay. audio on that site. Um, okay. While we're uh, doing a little bit of surfing here. Okay. And again, we've done some of this. Uh, we've, we've done we've done a piece on this in a previous one. So let's take a look. We got we got all kinds of things here. Uh, Stanley Cup playoffs coming up, but if we click on that, we're not going to hear anything. Right. right? So we got to go find something that's really going on right now. Um, Here's radio station. Okay. Let's try this one in Dallas. Okay. KLIF 5:70 a.m. We're going to click here and listen. Now, what we're doing is it's actually firing up a helper application. This is still in the form of a AudioNet and iCode are giving you the chance to win $2,500. And we get a little ad at the beginning. Click on the iCode. AudioNet icon people have to brag about their service. And thanks for listening to AudioNet. <laughs> now, look at the bottom where it says buffering. It's building up our stream. We went a little bit overboard. Well, 817 is so running this is out just, of numbers as well. This is live radio. And, uh, this is a talk radio station in Dallas. Right. And there's probably a few dozen and, radio stations uh, around the planet. Right. To keep this area code, obviously. Now, you're talking about the buffering. The buffering is so that it, um, let me pause this for a sec. The buffering is so that on a slower line, it actually gets a little bit ahead of it, so that if it <laughs> loses data for a while, it can actually catch exactly. up. Exactly. And it, it can respond to any outages along the way. Cool. But, uh, so, so we just kind of listen to this and away we go. So that's pretty neat. How they split this thing geographically. So, okay, well, actually, that's about all the time we have for surfing today. So uh, any last comments? Stay plugged in, and <laughs> we'll see you on the net.
Thank you.